Good afternoon. Shh, shh. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Tony Birch. Um, I'm a writer and a teacher of writing at the University of Melbourne. And I'm here today and several times this first half of the year as a host of these Text in the City events. So I'm here to ask the questions for once rather than have to answer them all. Um, the book we're doing today, of course, is this remarkable novel, Brooklyn, by Colin Tobin. That is the cr correct pronunciation, according to himself on YouTube. And our guest today is Corey Perkin. Um, Corey Perkin is um, a journalist of many decades of standing, um, working at both the Melbourne Age and the Sunday Age, and also with the Australian. Um, Corey is also a passionate bookseller, and I remember seeing an article on Corey several years ago when she first opened her bookshop in Hawkesburn, and people were talking about what sort of a crazy idea is this, trying to be an independent bookseller in a marketplace where supposedly print books, particularly novels, are in decline. And one of the things I still remember from that article that I read was that clearly um, we hoped that it made some commercial sense, but we were hearing someone talk about a passion for books as much as talking about an industry. And I think it's it's great testament to start um, the series at the Wheeler Centre with someone such as Corey Perkin, who, who's not only a bookseller, but obviously a passionate um, book reader. Um, so, Corey, how do you feel about my pronunciation of the author of this? I'm happy with that pronunciation, Tony. Thanks for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, bit of a shock being back at school after such a lovely holiday. Um, my question to you is, though, Tony, how do you pronounce the main character's name? Oh, well, I've cheated there as well, though, unfortunately, because um, when I wasn't sure how to pronounce Colin Tobin, and I thought it was Toybin. Um, I went online and he was having an interview with the Radio National program, and he, the first question I asked of him was, how do you pronounce your name? And he said, well, it's Toe, as in Toe, and Bean, as in Bean, Tobin. And then I listened more closely, and as he started to talk about the novel, he, he said, Eilish. Ah, well, yes. Well, um, I googled it too, and there and and there are about half a dozen different um, uh, pronunciations of her name, and I ended up looking at a site called. I think this is right, although you probably will think it's so irrelevant to look up irishbabynames.com. And, um, and it rhymes with my wish, so it's Eilish, which is a really beautiful... The first time I read it, I was just going Ellis, 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 because it seemed to be the easiest way of doing it. And in fact, if I slip into that today, I apologise. It's not the right, um, not the right pronunciation. But um, Eilish is such a beautiful name. It is. And so what we know, if nothing else about this book, we know how to pronounce the author's name and the, um, the main character. Um, I want to start by actually... I, by looking at some great interviews, by the way, with, with the author, if, if you haven't done so already on, on YouTube, there are some really great um, conversations that he has with, with people here in Australia and overseas. Um, one of the things that he, that he talked about, which is obviously a, a key to the book, in his opinion, he said, Mig migration is the history, the history of Ireland. And he said, obviously, people know things such as the potato famine. There's many books being written about the troubles, various forms of sectarian and violence and, 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 and confrontation in Ireland, but he said there is not there is not a family in Ireland that hasn't been touched directly by migration. In, in other words, in every family there's a story of loss. There's a story of someone who left and went away and often were never heard of again. So very few people um, returned. And so there's this sort of sense of absence and loss for a family member um, in Irish history. Um, but one of the things that um, Corrie and I w w were corresponding over this in the last few days was a, a, a something that Corrie wanted to talk about and raise was was what was the catalyst though for, for the novel and mm. you had a very I think interesting understanding of that through something you'd read about um, yeah. Tobin. Yeah, look you, many of you first of all as Tony said read as many online interviews as you can with the author and also um, download interviews in fact he's, he did a terrific one at the Wheeler Centre not so long ago and it's easily um, accessible on your computer 
The other thing I would urge you to do, and it will probably only take you about an hour, but um, read a, a brief history of Ireland north and south, and as a complete picture. Um, because as Tony said, the, the, the spectre of migration has hung, hung over this country for centuries and centuries. And in fact, at the time that the book is written, um, in the 1950s, half a million people left Ireland at that time. Most of them went to England. Um, as you say, a sense of loss, and also um, just another point to really reflect upon is that um, in, the, in the gold rush era, for example, which was the first wave of Irish migration to Australia, a lot of English people and Scottish people came to the colonies as well. A number of them went back with this newfound wealth. The Irish tended to stay because there wasn't a lot to go back to. Um, so it's all, it is really kind of interesting thinking about our own connection here in Australia with um, Irish history and Irish migration. But um, in an interview, which again I would urge you to have a look at, Malcolm Knox, who is a writer and wrote a piece for the Sydney Morning Herald in 2010, was um, did a terrific profile of Colin Toy. I, I pronounce it Toy, but I'm going to have to keep saying that because I can't. Toy Bean. Toy Bean. Um, and um, and uh, he write. I'll, I'll just quote Malcolm because it's a rather beautiful sort of couple of paragraphs. Um, Soon after September 11, 2001, Colm Tobin managed to offend one of his audience while speaking at the New York Public Library. Quote, I said that when I looked at photographs of the firefighters who went into Twin Towers, their faces looked to me like Irish faces, Tobin recalls. I hadn't yet learned how careful outsiders have to be when talking about race in America, and I'd put my foot in it. Someone stood up and said aggressively, what do you mean by Irish faces? Causing offence would not come easily to Tobin, a notoriously affable Irishman. He had to think on his feet. Quote, I started saying, a man whose eyes are soft but his mouth is stubborn, a man who loves and hates with seriousness but doesn't talk about them, a man who's bad at working for himself but good at working for others. A man who's better with his daughters than he is with his sons. While speaking, Tobin also began to ask himself, what is the equivalent Irish woman going to be like? The question was the seed from which she would grow Eilish Lacey, the heroine of Brooklyn, Tobin's 12th book and 6th novel. Eilish's story, told with aching restraint, tugs her between a claustrophobic family life in Enniscorthy in the 1950s and a new ex existence across the Atlantic in Brooklyn. Now, that's a, I think that's just a really sort of compelling... Um, there must have been lots of other catalysts as well. If you've read um, the author's um, previous works, particularly Blackwater Lightship, which is just such a beautiful novel, he has a real um, a skill, I think, of, of writing from a female perspective. Although, as Alex Miller, one of your colleagues in the literary world, Tony, would say, what's the difference? Like, men should be able to write as women. You know, what's the difference? It's just another character. I do think that there are sensitive activities there and I think that he just creates this absolutely wonderful um, woman but it's interesting that it came a part of that catalyst came from that experience talking about the firefighters who fought on September 11. One of the things that in our in our exchanges is that I think you have a very strong sense that he, he does tap so successfully into Eilish's inner world now, she could be one reading, and I, I, I'm being a bit of a devil's advocate here, as, as an overtly passive character. Um, how do you think he does tap into her inner world? What it is through the sort of unspokenness of her and her sense of dutifulness, perhaps, that you think he, he captures so well? Well, some people might read Brooklyn and think, oh, it's a book about migration, or it's a book about place, Brooklyn the Irish village, and then Brooklyn. In fact, for me, it is a story about a woman's inner world. Um, it's an old-fashioned style literary device, I think, that he employs here, which is very much the third-person narrator uh, subjectively watching the world, but with an objectivity that allows the reader to really get in there. Because as the... As the um, 
As the character is exploring her feelings, new places, uh, fear and the trauma that comes with migration when you're on your own especially, um, she, she actually takes the reader on the journey because she's exploring how she feels. Um, I think it's really, as I said earlier, it's a really incredible journey that a man can take us on, Tony. It's, it can't be easy to, to write the inner world of a woman. Um, I'm not quite sure, you know, why he carries it off so well. Um, Tobin said, sorry, Tobin. No, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll go with Tobin, Tobin. because I'll drive us crazy. And then we'll have a vote at the end. <laughs> um, he said in another interview at the time of the book's release, he said, Alish is someone who by her nature is a second daughter. She's not brave and has always had everything important done for her. Everything about her is withheld. She's holding her breath as if she's afraid that by breathing out she'll offend somebody. Mm. And I just, I loved the way she sort of tentatively picked her way through life's experiences. But as she became older and more assured, and then particularly at the end of the book when she returns home, she really has a certain sort of confidence. And we, the readers, start to trust her. We're so nervous. Like the vomiting scene, the famous vomiting scene in the, in the ocean liner, which would just clearly put all of us off transatlantic travelling forever in a boat. But, um, you know, so, um, so, like every time she vomits and it's behind another bucket or behind another door, we're just oh, aching for her and her trauma and her tension and her embarrassment and, and all of that sort of thing. And we're really there. I think that's actually one of the most compelling passages um, in the book. And if you do get a chance to kind of somehow use that in a sack or an exam, you know, I'd really urge you to look at it as a piece of detailed writing about what mm. happens now, what happens next. Absolutely. And I can attest to that of having vomited for two hours <laughs> trying to swim with dolphins in New Zealand a couple of years ago. But um, one of the things that we want to come to, I want to come to an important point be, near five o'clock before we go to questions, because mm. I want to read a statement about uh, an interpretation of the ending of the book, because I love the way that you talked about you, your belief in a growing confidence in her, and mm. I think this interpretation would, would, would not have that same view, but mm. I think it's, I, I see real growth in her as a character. Now, what, you know, one of the important notions here is the notion of home. Mm. So she's in this fairly, you know, cloistered, almost claustrophobic and very closed community that she lives in in Ireland, then, then moves to this massive, you know, cosmopolitan metropolis of, of, of New York. Um, what do you f feel the author here, through his portrayal of Eilish and her experiences, what do you think he's saying about home specifically, even in the home and sort of the notion of home more, more widely? Well, you know, for me, Tony, I, I reckon, um, I wrote a piece about what is home a few years ago for The Age, and um, it was a really tough one for me to write about because my father had died when I was 14 and my mother two years later had moved into state and I only had a brother who was older than me. So I basically, I didn't live alone, but you know, I was kind of um, sort of, I'd lost my, in a space of kind of three years, I'd lost family, home, family, and it was all a bit perplexing. And I thought long and hard at the time about what is home. And home is a place where you feel loved and it may not necessarily be from family members, and that's okay. You know, you might live in a fantastic foster family, or you might live with your aunt, or you might live with a group of flatmates, or you might find as you get older, you know, you probably hear your parents or people say, you know, my friends are closer to me than my family, you know, my sister-in-law sister, dri sister -in -law drives me nuts, or whatever it is. And I, I often think about what is home, and it's a place where you walk in the door and you feel loved. If if you happen to live there as well, that's a real bonus. And what really throws me with the whole Eilish thing, and her mum's, I mean, Rose, I think, had essentially good intentions for her sister, but the mother who should be so in tune with her daughter and see that she's kind of happy working at um, Miss Kelly's grocery shop and she's, she's the second daughter, as we said before, showing all of those sort of second daughter kind of symptoms, as the author said before in that interview. Um, she should have been perceptive that her daughter was not one to leave home, that her daughter needed home. The brothers had left. 
Rose was out and about, you know, working and playing golf and everything. And Eilish was somebody who needed home. Suddenly she loses her home, but not through choice or um, dramatic circumstance. She's sent away from home. And I find that just so incredibly sad. And you re we probably remember in the book there's that really touching, moving, you know, I don't often tear up in a book. I do in movies and stuff, but um, and you know, Master Chef. But um, I don't. I don't often in a book. And both times I've read this passage when it first came out, and then again on the weekend, I, I was really moved to tears. Remember that scene where she suffers homesickness, mm -hmm. and nobody, in, like um, the priest, doesn't know what's going on. And sorry, I've forgotten the the colleague at work, the lady's name escapes me. I'll think of it in a second. It's here somewhere. Um, uh, Miss Fortini, you mm -hmm. know, they're all watching her very closely and they suddenly become aware what the problem is and she misses home. She has no home. And I suspect that's why she fell in with Tony because he offered her love. Yes, he had a he home life. He was good looking as well, though. Pretty hunky, he? yeah, pretty hunky. But, um, but you know, she sort of, um, home became, and home sort of became the business school mm -hmm. and her colleagues there, and then home became the shop and home became the boarding house. But really when Tony offered her a chance for home, that then became home. Well, it's interesting because she seems, she does seem so ill-equipped for the move and, you know, it's, it is so graphic in the sense of when she's on the boat and she's, she's vomiting and she's in, you just feel for her so um, strongly. But one of the, again, you said that she returns with a sense of confidence. Now, it's also, it's clearly there in, in, in physical. It's interesting that people said that they'll notice her tan mm -hmm. and you forget, oh, how little sun there must be in Ireland. And, and she's got you know, more modern clothes and probably more modern sort of sense about herself. But it can't be just in the physical. What do you think, when do you think the psychological shift occurs that gives us some confidence to return a little more assured than she was when she left? Well, I suppose we all go through it, don't we? Um, if you, uh, you know, go back to your old neighbourhood or if you, um, you know, when you're a kid, your parents have their best friends and you have lots of barbecues and you do things with, you know, the other family in your life. And then maybe you don't see each other for a few years or you don't see the parents and you walk into the room as an assured older teenager and the last time they saw you was a little kid. And they don't just say, oh, how you've grown, which is obvious because you have, but they really like you've changed, you know, you've grown, what they mean grown, they mean you've evolved. And, and there's that wonderful feeling, I think, when you're on the receiving end of all these compliments, is that you kind of feel a bit chuffed that, yeah, you know, I have, I have changed, I am different. You know, for her, um, she, I do think that Rose's death left her in real shock. I don't think um, Eilish, before the death, would have necessarily jumped into bed with Tony. I don't think she would have married him like that so kind of quickly. I think she was in shock. And, um, and I think you are in shock when somebody dies. You can be in shock for six months or a year, possibly even longer. Not just kind of going through the, although a lot of people do, just through the mechanics of the day, just to get through the day. But you, you just, you're kind of in a, a fu you're in a bit of a fuzzy world and you make decisions that are not necessarily always the right ones. And I think that when she goes home and deals with it all, it's like this, the, you know, it's like she comes alive again or something. But I suspect it's got more to do with, the, as much to do with the death and that whole resolution. Yeah. It is interesting that because she, you know, she does, she sleeps with Tony soon after Rose has died and she has this, sense of guilt about it but it does reflect what might be seen as a bad decision in fact is that people often respond to death even though she may be chocked with a real intensity and emotional and physical intensity and some people may find themselves in fact removing themselves from physical contact with other people but mm -hmm. some people are drawn to a need mm -hmm. an almost insatiable need for, for physical contact i thought he wrote that scene with real subtlety, but real at the same time, there was a real intensity emotionally to it. Um, I yeah, want to okay. ask you about some of the contrasts that I picked up in, yeah, in the sure. book, and then I want to tease out this um, 
discussion about the ending of the book, which we're both um, interested in, and I think clearly it'd be of, of important interest to students. I mean, some of the contrasts that I picked up, have and they're pretty straightforward, is obviously tradition versus modernity. Mm -hmm. There's the notion of Miss Kelly's um, terribly oppressive <laughs> corner shop and the department store, which again is all about modernity. There's a sort of economic stagnation of Ireland in the post-war period, whereas there's the potential for economic opportunities um, in, in, in New York. And there's also this notion of a closed or very small community of the town she grows up in, as opposed to, again, some sense of independence and individual expression when she moves to New York. Mm. And of course, there's that notion of the monoculture of the small town to the cosmopolitan as the big city. Now, they seem like absolute contrast, but one of the things that interested me was the, the figure of, uh, of the priest, the father flood, because while with the move to New York there is this sense of you know, dramatic change, you still have this sort of or subtle, but this mm. sort of patriarchal mm. control or, or a sort of a, a sense of, of his patronage overseeing everything. It's almost that a bit of the old world has to go with her or a bit of the old world has to go with the Irish migrant and you try in a sense to replicate something of the old country in the new world, but it doesn't quite hold because I think this is, this is clear in the scene when he holds that Christmas mm. party and he's holding it for all those people who have come to the new world expecting prosperity and have never found it. Mm. So it's not so clear, those contrasts, or that there's a sort of breakdown. Of, of I wondered in that scene how many of them had he been responsible for bringing out, mm. and was he in fact feeling guilty? But, mm -hmm. look, you know, I, I did not like him at all until, <laughs> until the moment when he can really, really read her homesickness. Um, in a very intuitive and I think caring and loving way, but I hated the way, I hated the way he and Rose hatched the plan without even talking to Eilish about it, and I wondered whether he had a bit of a crush or a, he was kind of. Um, in awe of Rose's, clearly she was a charismatic person. Isn't it funny how somebody's not in a novel for a lot of the time, but they really, you know, their presence is really felt there. It's really strong. Um, I love a novel that does that. You know, it's kind of like the character that's off screen, but is constantly there. And I think Rose is like that. But um, Father Flood um, redeems himself, you know, and I was angry, I was sort of angry the way he really put it on um, Eilish and the others to come and help with his Christmas lunch. And yet as the day unfolded and then there's the singing and the fiddle playing and so on, I could see that his intentions were in fact um, quite honourable to mm -hmm. bring together this group of people who had been part of a big diaspora who felt disconnected and probably unloved and he gave them a sense of feeling community. And then, you know, as I said, I did kind of really love him for caring about her. Can I ask you a question? You've raised Rose again. I mean, it's quite intriguing that, in a sense, if, if you, again, you take that notion and you talk about the second daughter, who's, who's much more passive, um, seemingly, particularly in the first half of the book, whereas Rose is, is, she is an independent woman, seemingly, she dresses very elegantly and she plays golf. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you might think, well, she would be the ideal candidate for migration. She'd, you know, she'd be, feel right at home in New York. She's got that sort of grace and confidence about her. Um, I'm interested in, in why it may have been that she pushed Eilish. Don't you think she knew she was unwell? Well, so I'm asking. Yeah, I mean, I don't know whether anybody else felt that. I, I think when they go through, or when, um, when Eilish's mum is telling her, you know, Rose knew for a long time, mm. it, it made me wonder whether in fact you know, Rose could see herself as the great manipulator, you know, in a good way, but whether she could just, okay, the brothers are going over there and they'll send money back and we'll send Eilish off to yep. New York and that'll work and, you know, and without really thinking about, you know, will, will my mum be alone? Well, that's interesting because that, that is one of the speculations and, and I think for some people it'd be, it would be the case. Then it raises an interesting question, and that is that if Rose, and Rose knowing that she's sick and you know, possibly or terminally ill, that sending Rose away, is that to give her her freedom 
because if she stays and then Rose passes away, she'll never be able to leave. Oh. And then, of course, it raises another question. With that knowledge, she, she knows, or she can predict, I think, that she's, her mother's going to be alone. So there are very complex mm. emotional tensions in that. Um, I she's think, a gorgeous I, character. Yeah. Now, before we go to our questions, which we'll do in a moment, I'm going to read a statement, which is a claim yeah. about the ending of the book, and I, I want you to, to respond. Um, I love the ending, by the way, and it, it, in the end it becomes so moving mm -hmm. and it really does creep up on you. But this is um, from some notes about Brooklyn. So Eilish returns to New York, but no more as a result of her own decision than when she originally embarked. The novel ends on a decidedly sombre note with Eilish imagining her mother informing Jim Farrell that her daughter has gone back to Brooklyn. The final image of the novel is Eilish on the train, taking her forever away from both the home and the man she genuinely loves. The unmistakable sense of a second forced departure, this time far more painful than the first, evokes a type of personal renunciation that casts a retrospective shadow over the preceding action and positions Eilish as a figure of authentic sorrow. Now, one is... I, didn't know, I don't know that she loves Jim Farrell more than she loves Tony. You can love two people at the same time. But the fact that it's more painful than the first. My sense of reading it was when she went to Miss Kelly's shop and she informed Eilish not only that she had a photo taken oh. with Jim. And she, she was onto her. <laughs> she was onto her. But to me, there's a realisation that you can, there's no privacy in this town. It's so claustrophobic. Everybody knows. It, it, to me, it's almost like she part of it is running away, mm -hmm. that she realised going back would also bring with it this closed community that she eventually also needs to leave. I think you're, my feeling is that you're absolutely right. Thank you. You know, um, Jim, a lot of us, particularly, you know, a lot of the girls in the audience will have this experience that you may get back one day with a guy, even if it's just for the night or something, who has... Um, jilted you or ignored you or dropped you or whatever it is years or months or whatever before and when they seek you out and you go on the date or you have the kiss or whatever it is that you do it's such a great feeling of revenge you know you can't help but go yes you know I kind of come out of this with my head held high it's um it's like a it's like a um it's like um the completion of the circle and if, particularly if they break your heart, which is not quite the case in this mm. instance because she was just rejected at the dance, but it did make her feel inferior and small. And we don't like Jim for that. Now, he explained his reasons later as to why he felt awkward also at the dance. But, you know, it was something that she never forgot. And so she comes to town. She's sought out by him. They have a lovely day. He imagines a future with her. And she actually has him in the palm of her hand. And it's like handing her another little bit of power. You know, she has power to um, deal and organise her mum. She's, her brothers turn to her and say, you must come home. She has some power there. Um, her friends are in awe of her, you know, that she's become sort of lovely and beautiful. Her bookkeeping skills are impeccable. They offer her a new gig in town. Um, so, you know, I think, Jim, I, I think you're right. I don't think it's about, you know, she had to make a choice, A or B. I think the Miss Kelly in the shop, you know, I'm on to you episode is like the cold water that she mm. needed to go, oh, hang on, what am I doing back here? I think so, that's my interpretation. I mean, just, just briefly, it seemed to me that then leaving the se second time, she leaves a much stronger person than she I think she, she does. I yeah. think she does. Now, whether it works out with Tony or not, you know, I don't know. Um, does she go back and kind of fall in love or re Had she been in love and she re-falls in love in a deeper way? I'm not really sure. But um, I think she understands that there's a ter pretty terrific life out there um, with Tony and all the brothers. <laughs> Tony's are like that. Okay, um, <laughs> what we're going to do now is, is turn it over to the audience and clearly um, um, questions particularly for Corrie um, from students and, or teachers and we have, we have just over 15 minutes. So if you can keep your questions brief enough that we get through as many questions as possible, that'd be really helpful. So who wants to be brave enough to start us off? Can I just say something while people are thinking or, you know, getting their courage or whatever? Um, 
that um, I've, uh, I've just recently had three kids all go through year 12 and the last child finished last year. So uh, she's having, you know, the summer of her life this year. And, um, and funnily enough, all my three kids got exactly the same marks, so that's really weird because they're very different people. But uh, what I loved about the way each one of them tackled English, and they did it in a very different way, was uh, the, I think the key to their success, and this has nothing to do with me, it's just because we're a family of readers and there are lots of books, is to, um, to read other stuff that's not just on your syllabus. I know your teachers probably tell you this a lot, but um, try and get a, another novel or two by the authors or the playwrights mm. that you're studying um, under your belt. Use that June, July holiday as a real break. So actually try and read some other kind of interesting books and look, your teachers will have a whole list of them. If you want to ring me at the bookshop with some ideas, themes and things that feed into it, I cannot begin to tell you how it helps. Um, one of the books my daughter did last year was Atonement, and when we went away for holiday in the middle of the year, um, I got her to read, you know, On Chesil Beach. Something small, something, you know, light, but it really does help with your understanding of an author. So that would be just one of the few tips that I would give you all. Yeah, and with Turbin, he's got um, remarkable short story collections which dip in and out of these themes yeah. very strongly. So He has can, a real mother issue, yeah. I have to tell you. <laughs> yeah. Now, who's going to start us off, please? Way down the back there. Hey, on your uh, microphone's coming. He has a very loud voice. Yeah. And do you want to stand up so they can see how handsome you are? <laughs> oh, that's embarrassing. <laughs> What are, your, what are your thoughts on Georgina, the lady Eilish um, meets on the uh, sea liner? How does she influence the new change? Well, mm. you know, I think she, don't you think she gives um, Eilish a bit of courage? I think she makes Eilish quite curious about what's, you know, like what's ahead of me, meeting new people. Um, yeah, um, I don't know, what did you think, Tony? Well, I, it's interesting because she's a little bit abrupt when she first enters the room, but she's she's much more forward and she's 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 very streetwise, worldwise. Yeah. I think the other thing that she might stand for is in the sense that um, she is very cosmopolitan in the sense of going backwards and forwards mm -hmm. um, often, and I think what, what she's conveying to us is that, you know, we don't know what her character was like before she meets Eilish on, on the on the show but we certainly know that she's, she's experienced. So through that experience, there's a confidence and a, you know, a real strength in her. She's a bit yeah. sort of... And she sort of says, I, I liked the contrast, you know, Eilish has come from um, kind of a closeted um, yeah. conversations where people don't really say what they really think. Indeed, you know, her family plots to send her overseas without telling her. So that's a pretty big secret. And then she meets Georgina, you know, who's quite... Um, open mm. and that to me was a nice contrast between what was and what can be so I think she's a what you might call like the metaphor you know of, of traveling across the ocean with this kind of person is actually a really good one and there's also a notion that she does give I said that, that that moment of protection and support yeah. because you know she's in a terrible situation she's she's worrying about if the smell and that all the, the the mess it she's is made. just a hideous and she, scene. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, just a sense of embarrassment. Yeah. She makes her feel at ease. And I think that even though she's a yeah, bit of a rougher character, there's something quite maternal about her as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? Um, did you think that. This one. <laughs> uh, That's better. Uh, did you think that Eilish lost her sense of class by the end of the book? Because I took the umbrella. Uh, that she forgot at the post office as a metaphor that represents her class. So you the umbrella and the metaphor. Tell me again about the umbrella and the. Um, at the beginning of the book, in yeah, yeah. Miss Kelly's store, there's some umbrellas. Oh yes, yes, that's right. And then when she talks to Miss Kelly after she's returned, Miss Kelly goes, uh, "Don't forget your umbrella." Mm. And then uh, she forgets it at the post office. So I took that as some kind of leaving her life behind sort of thing? Uh, no, no, I took it as a kind of representation for class because according, my, according to my teacher, umbrellas were expensive back then and... <laughs> uh, yeah, I think your teacher's onto something. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, 
look, it could be. Uh, to me, it, it, you know, I, I didn't think about it until you sort of mentioned that. I remember that, and I and I wasn't sort of thinking, oh, the scallywag, you know, what a waste of money. Um, for me, it was kind of like, you know, no possessions. She didn't ask anything of her mother in terms of possessions. Or when her mum said, take Rose's clothes, take her coat, take her coat, you know, Alice didn't want that. I don't think she saw it as a spooky thing. I think she just thought, no, it's okay. You know, I don't need this stuff. I don't need, not necessarily reminders, but I just don't need that connection with my past as perhaps she might have when she left a couple of years earlier, you know, clinging onto things that were her own. But maybe it is, maybe it is a sense that she's gone up a bit. There is a, a sort of a petty attachment to manners that I think she, she's allowed to let go of by by doing that. And I think that that comes, I think, after that, that her ability to, to deal with Miss Kelly in a different way psychologically. So I think, it, you know, these things are difficult often as writers that, you know, that reading, um, it'd be interesting if, if Mr. Tobin was here, because it's interesting often with writers, they'll, they'll all actually sometimes reflect by saying, I never thought of that, mm. or it wasn't conscious. But it doesn't have to be to have meaning. So your point could be very—it could be very apt without the right and necessarily it's consciously or you know self-consciously inserting that into the narrative. So it's a very interesting point to make because it's quite minor in some ways, but it can still it have quite specific, something yeah, important. Yeah. yeah. So it's a really good point to pick up on. Another one down there. Is anyone down the front going to put your hand up? What we're we doing here, people? Go, <laughs> The character Dolores, when she's at Miss Kehoe's house and then she goes to the dance with her, like, what do you think the purpose of her is? Like, I thought it was kind of showing Eilish's past and this, like, shy person no one wants to talk to. I don't know. Talk about that. I thought she was... <laughs> I think I know, I, I know that person, don't I? <laughs> I, I, um, I thought Dolores was sort of... Um, funny yucky, really. You know, funny she's a bit, yucky. Yeah, a bit funny yucky. Write that down. Yucky. That's a theoretical I term. I just um, like she was kind of sort of confident, like where are the boys? Where are the boys? You know, and I just was not happy with what she wore to the dance at all. I was not happy with that, and um, and you know, one of the, I, I think Eilish actually endeared herself to me more with that scene because she was so caring of Dolores. Mm. You know, she got to the dance and then she just wanted to kind of flick her somehow, but not in a, a, an obvious way or a bullying kind of way. And she didn't make Dolores feel a lesser person. And she was prepared to do as she was told, you know, take Dolores with you. But... Um, do you think there's a comparison, though, with, with Dolores and the way that Miss Kelly treats the shop assistant in such a demeaning way? So that, that they're both minor characters in a way, but in a way they both epitomise young women being dismissed in some way because they don't have that class or they don't have that poise. I think so, and I think it says a lot about Eilish too. You know, mm. there was, there's obviously something quite instinctively... Um, uh, regal's not the right word... Um, and I certainly don't mean superior, but something quite... Uh, oh, what's the word I'm trying to think of? Just it's something quite composed and, uh, you know, classy, if you like, about Eilish. I think she's um, a deeply sensitive thinking person. We know that from the way um, Torben writes about her observations of things and her feelings of things. She's a deep thinker. And I think she has sort of a natural quality that people recognise. So Miss Kelly knows that she's above the other shop girls. Um, the boarding house lady knows that Dolores isn't really going to survive for too long if she doesn't have eyelash on her, ha on her arm when they go to the dance together. I think, that, I think people do, probably mm. as she grows older, eyelash actually becomes one of those really wise, wonderful women to whom people turn for, you know, advice, comfort. She's very genuine. She's a really genuine She's a, an unexpected heroine, I is, think. Is there a threat to that, though, because there is clearly, going back to, to Brooklyn and going back to Tony, she might be able to go and watch the, the Brooklyn Dodgers and go dancing, but she could end up on a quarter acre in Long Island having children. So clearly going back, even though we see growth, and I think we, we both agree, strength in her, there's a potential for that to be stifled. 
Well, I thought that she'd go back and she'd run the family building company and do all the books and they'd make a fortune. That's, that's what two. I thought. Yeah, well, that's what I thought. Because she'd really... You know, when she's offered the job back in um, Inniscorthy, um, which just comes sort of out of the blue, and they really, like, the chap... I can't remember his name, but he acknowledges her bookkeeping skills and everything. It's another sort of boost of her confidence, which mm. she's already been receiving with these terrific results and everybody saying, you know, you'll be promoted and you'll go here and you'll go there. And I think she probably does come back a deeply empowered person to the point where probably, you know, she goes back to married life and she says, you know, we're going to do something about this. You know, we're going to take the business in hand. That's how I kind of feel. I mean, it's interesting. I, I, I mean, I, I've never read many novels where, where bookkeeping is dealt with so poetically, but it's not something certainly not to be dismissed because she says, I don't make mistakes. She's so good at what she does. But, of course, by going to Brooklyn, we, there, is, there is uncertainty. There is risk. And so it's not like you, know, you can add up these figures, you can get an answer, and you don't make mistakes. She could make a mistake. And I think, again, it goes to her sense of courage that there is an unknown. She can't go back and with cer absolute certainty. And it's a very different process she's involved in psychologically than her ability to, to make sure the figures are right, which I think it, it, there's real meaning in, the, in that for our understanding of her as a character. Question? There's another question. Two more down there. We've got time for probably two more. Uh, hello. I just hello. wanted to get <laughs> um, what you thought was the significance of the parts in the book where they did, did seem significant but led nowhere, such as um, when she thinks she sees her father in the, um, at Christmas or the incident with Miss Fortini. I uh, saw so what were your thoughts on those parts. Of What's the, the incident with Miss Forsini in the change room? Yeah, yeah, that. Like, it's such a, you know, wow moment, but it sort of leads nowhere. And the te and Mr. Rosenblum and yeah. all those. Yeah. Like, there's just a lot of bits that just, you read them and you think something more is going to develop with them, but nothing really does. I think that just, um, you answer too, Tony, of course. But okay. um, I was just going to say about Mr. Rosenblum. I think he is important sitting in there. Because he he um, he takes Alish into another world. Uh, she has a deeper understanding of what makes New York, particularly America, but New York through a kind of a Jewish experience, but also the people from all sorts of different cultures that go to the business school. Um, that's a that's. A setting that he's established and that's as she says you know she looks around the room and there's not one other Irish person but it's a melting pot and so for me Mr Rosenblum has really created um, Rosenbaum sorry um, has created this little microcosm of what her life can be like which is all people are equal you know we're all here to kind of do a job um, the Miss Fortini is uh, I think that scene in the changing room is really important because um, we still have a sense of the shy Eilish, and, but if she was really shy and really scared and really freaked out by being kind of hit on by her boss, um, I think she would have just absolutely collapsed. I think it shows uh, enormous um, resolve and maturity of her that she handles it quite delicately in the way that she does. She's still tortured with embarrassment and there's lots of you know, mentions of her red face and all this kind of thing. But I think she handles what could have been possibly a predatory situation. Certainly it is an unnerving situation. I think she handles it really well. Yeah, I mean, there's just a couple of things. I mean, I think Mr Rosenbaum is that one of the things that about that, I think when, when Tony reveals to her that you know, he lost everyone, his family, um, in the Holocaust, it's that she is in this place, Brooklyn, and is this co cosmopolitan world, and then it's a shock to realise here's this man who has no one. Mm. So in a sense, it's a similar experience of that profound sense of loneliness, that while you might think she's the person experiencing absence and loss in a new place. Here's a person, this is his home, seemingly, but yet he is completely alone and he has lost so much. Mm. I think... What about the father that... Um, well, I think that's interesting because mentioned. I think clearly that that didn't surprise me and I, um, I know that in my own experience, 
people that I've lost in our family, they, you see their, their faces in other people and you might think, oh, it's a similar look or a similar mannerism, but I think, yeah, the question, uh, it's a great question because I think it's really about when she's feeling that profound sense of absence or a sense of yearning in herself, it doesn't surprise me that she would see the face of someone who, she, mm. you know, her father who she'd loved. And on the Miss Forcini, I my wife's here and I, I, I always everything I've ever seen on television I always claim there's a lesbian subplot and I'm always wrong except one night on Midsummer Murders of all places um, and I was joking about it but I actually think there's another issue that she's very confident she has this seemingly outer this exterior of the, yeah, the businesswoman or the woman of authority in this department store so she has in a sense she, she's a reflection of what Eilish might become if she has courage but there's something there. She has to repress something of herself, her own emotion, her own needs, which, and I, rather than being necessarily predatory, are played out in this moment of deep attraction that, yeah, like anything in the 1950s, it wouldn't have been possible for mm. her to express that feeling or to mm. be open about her sexuality. Mm. So I think even in the sort of sense of the cosmopolitan New York of the 50s, we, everyone still has their secrets mm. and everyone still has their, their closeted self. Mm. Um, look, unfortunately it is um, 5.15 and we, we have to finish on time tonight because there's another gig coming in. I do want to say um, a couple of things in closing. One is clearly, you know, this is a very important year. These are important years of your VCE to all your students. So firstly, on behalf of the Wheeler Centre, I wish you all the success for the year. And secondly, of course, um, to thank Corey as our guest. Um, Corey has um, offered for you to call in at a bookshop in Haw Hawksburn, so please do call in, she'll answer more questions and maybe you'll buy a book. So please thank Corey.